Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, good morning. How are we doing? Good. Hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible, and we are super excited that you're here with us on this Sunday morning as we start this brand new series. Uh, but I will add to, to what Clay was saying a little bit earlier. We would love uh, to see you at Starting Point next week. If you've been coming for the last several months, maybe even the last year, maybe you've been coming longer than that, and you just want to take the next step in joining the church and partnering with us, uh, we'd love to see you next Sunday. Uh, college students, that's you as well. Uh, I'll say this probably every year as long as I'm pastor here, but one of the greatest things that you can do, college students, whether you're at Letourneau or Kilgore or ETBU, one of the greatest things that you can do in your two years or four years in college is find a church and join it and become part of it and give to it and not just take from it and consume from it, uh, but actually participate in it because here's the deal, you have something to offer us. And we believe that we have something to offer you as well. And so I, I want to encourage our, all of our college students uh, to attend as well, find out a little bit more about us. That's about as hard a sell as I'm ever going to give uh, on that class. So anyway, hope, hope you'll sign up and join us next Sunday. If you have your Bible or your James Scripture journal, uh, please turn with me to the book of James chapter 1. James is in the back uh, of your Bible just after the book of Hebrews. If you're going forward or if you start at the back and work your way backwards, you'll find it just after 1 Peter. This morning we begin a new series on the book of James, and we're going to be in this series through Thanksgiving up to the season of Advent. And I'm excited to explore this book together because it, it is my favorite book uh, in the New Testament outside of the four gospel accounts. Uh, there's lots and lots of practical stuff uh, in the book of James, and so I look forward to this journey over the next couple of months that we're going to take together. Um, make a quick statement for this series, just like we did for the Sermon on the Mount series earlier this year. I'll be teaching from the Christian Standard Bible. Um, for those who are curious about those types of things like translations and such, the, the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, was formerly the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Um, which was started back in the 1980s, and, and uh, they dropped the Holman from the title. Um, the, it, it was started by the former editor of the New King James Version uh, of the Bible, and they started back in the 80s, and then somewhere around 2017 or so, they just dropped Holman, which was the publisher's name uh, from the title, so now it's just the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, I've been using this translation in my personal Devo time for years now, and I've really come to appreciate uh, the balance between the, the word-for-word accuracy and the thought-for-thought -thought readability. It has a slightly more casual and conversational tone um, language-wise while staying true to the text. So anyway, with that said, let me give you a quick overview of a few themes that we find in the book of James. There, there's a couple in particular. The first is there's some amazing parallels between the book of James and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Again, we did a series on the Sermon on the Mount uh, heading into uh, Easter, and uh, that's Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. James begin in, in the first chapter uh, of James by describing the traits of, of what it looks like to walk in faith, telling us to count it all joy when we meet trials of, of various kinds. Just as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, rejoice in wisdom. Both tell us it's wise to avoid sinful anger. Before a righteous God, both talk about being doers, not just hearers of the word. Both discuss uh, the poor and, and, and showing mercy and um, that we're going to be recognized by our fruits. Like I could go on and on and on. And I don't believe that James was plagiarizing Jesus. I think it's just that he wanted us and the church uh, to not forget these important lessons from the Sermon on the Mount. Another thing I want you to see is this theme that James has repeatedly throughout the book, um, or his letter, of being double-minded. We first read about this in James chapter 1, it's around verses 7 or 8, he talks about not being double-minded, and, and so we see that James utilizes a ton of comparison language um, throughout his epistle, a lot of this or that language. For instance, we're going to see that James refers to the lowly and to the rich, he refers to uh, the doers and the hearers. 
He refers to partiality with the rich, and then he also refers to partiality with the poor. He says we'll, we'll talk about faith, and we'll talk about works. We'll talk about wisdom from above, wisdom from below. We'll talk about worldliness and godliness and blessing and cursing. And so James does this ping-ponging back and forth, calling out this tendency that we all have as humans and as Christians to be double-minded. Really, what we see in the book of James is a challenge to faithful followers of Jesus, to not just talk the talk, but to walk the walk. He really describes for us what it looks like at the intersection of faith and life. Or, as the subtitle to this series says, to have a faith that works. And so with that brief overview of a couple of themes, we're we're just going to look at verse 1 today. If you were here last week when we wrapped up our previous series, we looked at one half of one verse. Today we're getting crazy, and we're going to look at one whole entire verse. By the way, there's 108 verses in the book of James, and so if we were just to consider one verse a week, it would take us a little over two years, but I promise to not take that long. And so today we're going to look at just verse one, because I want to give you some introductory material. I want you to understand who James is. Uh, was, why he wrote this letter, and uh, just kind of form a foundation of what we're going to be getting into. So take a look at this first verse with me. James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. Okay, so the very first word in the book of James is the author James, and so we know who wrote the book. James wrote it. And you know, with letters, they did things a little bit different than we do them today. We start our letters by by saying, dear so-and-so, and and then writing the letter and then signing off at the end. They just put both at the very beginning just to save us some time. And the problem is, though, is is that it says James, and so we have to ask the question, which one? Which James? Because there is no less than four different men named James in the New Testament. And so let me just run through these uh, real quick. There's James number one, I'll call him, probably the most famous James. He's the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. And this James and his brother John were disciples of Jesus. They were fishermen from Galilee. Uh, They had an incredible nickname, Their nicknames were the Sons of Thunder, and they got that name because they wanted to nuke a whole Samaritan village who didn't receive Christ like they thought they should. This James is not the author because he died too early. He was martyred in Acts chapter 12. Herod uh, killed him, put him to death by the sword, and so we can just kind of set him aside. It's not this James. Uh, James number two was also a disciple of Jesus, but he was the son of a a guy named Alphaeus. And we really don't know much about him. Um, He was often called James the Less. Um, Some would say it was because he was short. I don't think that's why. Um, And and it's not because he's less significant uh, than other Jameses. Like personally, in the eyes of our Lord, he's not less significant. It's just that we know less about him than we know about James number one. And he was never seriously considered by scholars to be the author of this book. Uh, James number three. This guy was the father of Judas, not Iscariot. Uh, You may or may not know this, but Jesus had two followers named Judas. And we know less about this James than we know about James the less. And so maybe his name should be James the lesser than James the less. Anyway, he's only mentioned because he's the father of a disciple. And then James number four, the final James, he is the blood brother of Jesus. He's the oldest half-brother, the biological son of Mary and Joseph. James and Jesus have the same mother, but they have radically different fathers. And we read about Jesus' brothers in Matthew chapter 13. It says this, Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, okay? That James, that's the James that we believe, that most scholars believe, wrote this book or wrote this letter. And one of the reasons we believe that is not just because the other three um, don't qualify, but 
also, because the language in the text of the uh, epistle James matches and is very similar to a letter that's in Acts chapter 15 that this James wrote to the church at Antioch. There's lots of similarities in the language. And so for those reasons, scholars believe that James, the brother of Jesus, wrote the book of James. And and then typically at this point, I might share with you uh, from verse 1, Uh, why he refers to himself as a a, a servant or a bondservant or a slave, depending on what translation you're reading. Um, We might dive deeper into his audience, although I need to tell you a little bit about this because it says he's writing um, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad, um, which is interesting because, um, well, I think the most important thing that you should probably know about this is I believe James is referring to the scattering or the dispersion of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem that occurs around Acts chapter 8. Um, the early church started in Jerusalem. Most of them uh, were, were, were Jewish, but look what happens. This is Acts chapter 8, verse 1 says, the second half of that verse says, On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. And so in the aftermath of the resurrection of Jesus and this new faith, Followers of the way, as this is beginning to spread, the new Christians are being heavily persecuted in Jerusalem and fearing for their lives, they began to to move away from Jerusalem, to scatter out, to to disperse away from Jerusalem. That's the foundation of this book. We glean all of that from the first verse in the book of James. James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes a letter to the Jewish Christians who are are being persecuted, and as a result of this persecution, they're beginning to disperse and move out and move away from Jerusalem. And he writes to them, I believe, to encourage them to live consistently with what they've learned in Jesus. And so having said all of that, if I could share just one additional thing with you this morning, it would be that I want you to see that that James, Jesus' own brother, has a change of heart. He has a change of heart. Let me ask you, have you ever had a change of heart? Like maybe at one point in time you felt a certain way uh, about something or someone uh, and then your position on that person or that thing changed. I'll tell you one of mine. When I was growing up, when I was a kid, Um, at just about every family gathering, holiday, or church potluck, somebody would bring sweet potato casserole. Do you know what I'm talking about? Usually in like a little Pyrex dish, and it was sweet potatoes with marshmallows on top, sometimes some kind of syrupy something or or another. Some people would add pecans uh, to theirs. When I was a kid, uh, that was the most disgusting thing on the planet Earth. I mean, for the life of me, like, I didn't like sweet potatoes because of that. Wouldn't even try it. Didn't even. And I think it was because, I I think it was mentally, it was the idea of a potato, which I'd had plenty of, right? Whether they were hash browns or french fries or mashed potatoes, uh, you know, with gravy or whatever, um, or, or just a baked potato with, you know, bacon bits and, you know, all that yummy stuff in it and cheese and sour cream and chives. Uh, I think it was the idea of something being sweet with, with like all the savory stuff in it. It just sounded disgusting. I wouldn't even try it. It's like somebody would take a scoop of that. And I'm like, yeah, no, thank you. <clears throat> that was until I got married. When I got married, my wife's an excellent cook. And when we got married, one of the things that she loved to do was bake a sweet potato like you would a baked potato and cut it open and just put some butter in it. And so I show up one night, and that's what I'm having for dinner. And I'm young married, and so I'm going to eat it. Um, just word to the wise. And so I eat this baked, baked sweet potato, and it was amazing. I love sweet potatoes now. Um, I changed my mind. I have not changed my mind on sweet potato casserole. I don't know. <laughs> Why you would put marshmallows in your sweet potatoes, uh, that's probably never going to change, but I love sweet potatoes. Or maybe you've had a change of heart about someone, right? Like maybe you, you only knew someone from a distance, 
And then as you got to know them uh, a little bit better and spend a little bit more time with them, you thought, you know what? I used to think they were an egotistical jerk, but, but now that I got to spend some time with them, they're really not that bad. They've turned out to be pretty friendly. James has an incredible change of heart. You see, despite being half-brothers with Jesus, with the Son of God, it appears that James does not accept the authority of Jesus. He does not believe that Jesus, initially anyway, he does not believe that Jesus is who he says he is, who he claims to be. Um, let me show you this. This is John chapter 7. The Gospel of John chapter 7 says this. After this, Jesus traveled in Galilee since he did not want to travel in Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. The Jewish festival of shelters was near, so his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples can see your works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he's seeking public recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And here it is, verse 5. For not even his brothers, which includes James, believed him. So Jesus' brothers, who grew up Jewish, by the way, they've been waiting for a Messiah. They've been waiting for centuries for uh, this one to come that's coming through the bloodline. And in essence, they're saying to their brother Jesus, hey, Mr. Big Shot, if you're really him, like if you're really the Messiah, then go prove it on a bigger platform in Jerusalem, the epicenter of our religion of Judaism. Not only do they not believe him, but the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark tells us that James and his brothers and the rest of his family actually thought Jesus was a little cuckoo crazy. Jesus is just starting his his ministry is going out and about. Large crowds are being uh, attracted. They're following Jesus around. And, and look at what happens. Mark chapter 3, it says, When his family heard this, like they're just dumbfounded that anybody would want to follow him around. I, I mean, that, that's where this is coming from. They're like, wait, what? Jesus? People are following him around? Um, when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. Here's what they thought. They thought he was out of his mind because he kept saying he was God. That he was Savior. That he was Creator. And after hearing that, his family naturally is just a little bit concerned. Right? Seriously, how many of you, like if your brother started saying stuff like this, you'd be concerned too. I have two brothers. I have an older brother, Rob, a younger brother, Stephen. If I ever, you know, like log into Facebook and I were to see there in their profile, because, you know, everybody has a little user profile. If I were to ever log in and, and see that my older brother, Rob, just put in his profile uh, as a description for himself, I am God, that would be weird, right? I would say, listen, I know my older brother, Rob. He is a type A personality. And by the way, if you're watching this right now, I love you. But he's a type A personality. He's self-confident. Like I, I would like, I mean, I get all that, you know. But God? Yeah, I just, you know. Mm. And so listen, Jesus is going out and he's saying things like he created the heavens and the earth, that he's come to judge the living and the dead. And his family's like, we've got to get him home. We've got to run him a bath. He needs some chamomile tea right? He's not doing good. Listen, I, we, we laugh, but there's something really important here that I want you to see, because it could be that you're here and you're in the room today, that you have the same perspective today that Jesus' family did back then. A guy says he's God? That's crazy. And I would just say, if you're here today and that's you, welcome. We are glad that you're here. If Jesus' family started from that position, it's okay for you to start there as well. What's important here is to understand that Christianity is founded on the claim that Jesus is God. And some people would say it's a ruse. Some people would say it's a shell game. Some people would say Jesus was a con man and his disciples were con men. His family was in on it. Listen, his family was not in on it. 
His family did not initially believe his claims to be God, probably the exception being his mother Mary. But the other members of his family, people who probably knew him intimately, they resisted this. They were concerned for him. James didn't believe that Jesus was God. That is until something significant happened, and that is the death and resurrection of Jesus. We really don't read much else about James in the Gospels other than the couple of references I just cited for you. We don't learn much about him until after Jesus' death and resurrection. Acts chapter 1 tells us that Jesus' resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to uh, some disciples and his family, including uh, James. The Apostle Paul reiterates this in 1 Corinthians. He says this, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, So Paul's just sharing the gospel here. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep, some have passed on. And then look at verse 7. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And scholars believe the way this is worded here in verse 7 seems to indicate that that Jesus shows up and he has a a mano a mano, like a one-on-one, person-to-person encounter with James after the resurrection. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the reunion between James and his big brother Jesus after the resurrection? Like, I have no idea what that looked like, right? Maybe James opens the door and Jesus is there and Jesus is like, I'm back. I've conquered death. I told you. I I tried to explain this to you. I told you that I was God. You know, as Christians, we always like to play this game, like the what if, like one day when I get to heaven, if I'm allowed to ask questions. Have you ever played that game? Like one day I'm going to ask God, or I want to ask these saints, or, you know, I don't, there's no biblical reference for that. I don't think that'll probably happen, but, but if, But if I got to ask James, I would say, James, what was that like when you saw Jesus again for the first time? Like, did you you say, I'm sorry? Did you laugh? Were you shocked? Did you fall down and begin to worship him? Did you embrace him and just, like, weep? Like, what'd you do? Wherever James was, on the continuum of faith between belief and non-belief in Jesus, I believe this is the moment that that switch got flipped. This is that moment. What James once doubted and questioned, he now knows to be true. That Jesus is God, that Jesus is his creator, that Jesus is his substitute. James, the one-time unbeliever, once he saw his big brother risen from the dead, he changed. And he goes goes all in on his faith. From this moment on, history tells us that James becomes a great pastor. He begins to preach and teach. He stays in Jerusalem, and he becomes the lead elder, lead pastor of the church uh, that's formed there in Jerusalem. And from that point on, he's like unwavering in his faith. In fact, The Apostle Paul gave James a nickname. He called him the pillar. The pillar. The early church historians say that he had uh, two other nicknames as well. James the Just. That's an incredible name. That's kind of like Holy Hank. That's amazing, isn't it? James the Just. His other nickname was Camel Knees, which comes from praying a lot. That's why he... He got that name because he was on his knees so much they must have been hardened and kind of calloused looking. I guess that's what camel knees uh, look like. And so he's known as being a pillar. He's known as being a righteous man and a praying man. It's reported historically apart from Scripture that he was murdered. He was martyred somewhere around uh, A.D. 62. History records that religious leaders, the same ones that were responsible for killing Jesus, take James, the half-brother of Jesus, to the top of the temple and they throw him off the temple. 
to the ground. And they do this in the same way that, that Jesus was crucified, to do it publicly, to, to, to do it openly, to just try to shame him. History also records he's a pretty tough guy because when he hit the ground, that didn't kill him. And so when that didn't do the trick, they pick up stones and they stoned him and beat him to death. Historians also tell us that as this was happening, he echoed the words of his famous older brother, Jesus, by saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Here's what I want you to see. James is so utterly convinced that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus rose, that he's like, go ahead, kill me. It's okay. I'll, I'll just get to be with my brother in Jesus in paradise. And if you're here today and you're not a believer, I have to ask you, like, how in the world do you account for this? Like, think about it. What motive does James have here? Right? There's no fame for this. There, there's no glory. There's no monetary fortune to inherit. There was death. And he endured it because he no longer feared death, because he'd seen his brother Jesus conquer it. And so if you're here this morning and you've yet to believe in Jesus the Christ as your Savior, I would hope and pray this morning that you would consider having a change of heart. That wherever you've been on the continuum of faith between belief and non-belief, that, that you would come to the same place that James arrived at. That Jesus is God. That he died for your sin. That he rose from the grave, conquering sin, Satan, and death. That you would proclaim, he's my God, he's my Savior. Would you do that today? If you would bow your head and close your eyes with me for just a moment, I'm going to ask our worship team, if they would, to come back to the platform. And I'm also going to ask our prayer team if they would come up at this time. As we enter into a time of response, the band is going to begin to play here in just a second. Members of our prayer team are going to be down front here and... Uh, while they're coming, maybe you're here today. Maybe, maybe you're here and maybe you've already believed in Jesus. Maybe you've already tr trusted Christ as your Savior. But you've yet to experience life to the full, a life that's firing on all cylinders. My hope is that you would come as well. Either way, this is time uh, for you to respond to what the Holy Spirit may be prompting in your life. And so, again, if you're here and the Holy Spirit's moving in your life and you want to pray with someone or talk to someone or even ask questions about what it might mean to be a follower of Jesus, this is your time. Or if you simply want to come to the front and pray on your own, this is your time. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place.